I guess we didn't establish who would be doing the intro, so maybe I'll do it. Um, <laughs> so welcome, everybody. This is uh, um, uh, one of our weekly-ish uh, tech talks. And we're uh, here today with a couple of guests um, from, from Facebook uh, to talk about the, the hack programming language. And I will leave it to uh, you, Josh, to uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, your role at Facebook and, and uh, everything that you're doing there. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm a software engineer at Facebook. I currently work on the hack team, um, mostly doing open source stuff, but working on the hack type system in particular. And um, so hack is Facebook's dialect of PHP, for those of you who don't know. And I'm here to talk about hack, uh, an evolution of PHP. And in particular, I've subtitled this talk, Continuing to Take PHP Seriously. In a lot of ways, it is an evolution of a talk given by Keith Adams at Strange Loop a couple of years ago, talking about the good points of PHP and actually taking the language seriously, um, and then hack and taking the language even further than that. So this talk is going to be divided into basically four parts. First, I'm going to start by giving some background on PHP, for those who aren't familiar. Then I'm going to introduce hack and talk about some of the uh, ways hack fixes problems with PHP while taking a lot of the good things uh, away from the language and keeping those. I'm going to talk about a couple of the killer features of hack. In particular, its static type system and async functions. And then I'm going to go through some of the bonus features of a language, a um, bunch of smaller things that are also really useful. So PHP. Um, PHP is a language that people love to hate. Uh, but it turns out that a lot of engineers are really productive in PHP. It has a bunch of nice features that at least I don't see in most, if any, other programming languages. In particular, it has a really fast edit refresh cycle that allows for fast, fast developer iteration. You can go write some code, save it in your editor, go to your browser, press refresh, and see your changes immediately. There's no lengthy compilation step. There's no type checking step. Nothing like that. Edit, refresh, changes have happen immediately. The fast feedback loop there at least has served Facebook really, really well to, let develop, to be, make developers really productive, to, to see changes like that and iterate quickly. And I think that's a really good thing of language in general. It also has a really nice conceptual model, the, the request model. Whenever you start a request, you start with a blank slate. You go maybe get some stuff out of Git and post params, fetch from database or memcache, do some computations. Then um, at the end of the request, everything that you have done that you haven't either explicitly persisted to a database or anything like that is all thrown away. There's no global state. No, anything like that that you don't explicitly read or explicitly persist. Basically, the web server is stateless. This is a really nice mental model to work with because you don't have to worry about possible global state polluting between requests, any sort of locking or mutexes or concurrency. No potential problems can come up like that. The language model completely disallows it. That said, PHP is a language that people love to hate. Um, in my mind, this is a pretty iconic image the double-clawed PHP hammer, uh, which a guy named Ian Baker built and photographed based off of a rant that someone else wrote called PHP, a fractal of bad design. And um, this guy actually worked for us. That is good to know. <laughs> um, sorry, I realized I forgot to say, um, I, I would like to hold questions and other comments till the end. Till the end. Um, in any event, double-clawed hammer for PHP uh, from a rant called fractal of bad design. Uh, People, people really love to hate PHP, love to write rants about how awful the language is. And at least some of that hate is warranted. Uh, so here's one of my favorite examples. Here's some code in PHP on the left. You can see that there's this first and second here. Um, I'll use a laser pointer for the people in the room. This is an array literal with two elements, first and second, two string literals. Then we have this list assignment syntax, which is sort of like a primitive pattern matching that PHP has. And then we're going to bar dump, in other words, print out the contents of the variables A and the variable B. What is this going to print? It's going to print two strings, first and second. This is basically the definition of the list assignment syntax. You take an array, and you assign out the two elements in the array and print them, and then so we have this. So then what happens if you do that to something that isn't an array? What happens if you do it to a string? In some languages, strings are arrays of characters. In which case, you would expect this to print A, or excuse me, to print HA, the first two letters of the string hagfish. In other languages, strings aren't arrays of characters. They're buckets of bytes, or you can model them various other ways. And so you wouldn't expect this to work at all. Maybe it would throw an error or it would do something like that. 
So um, what does this do in PHP? Uh, well, both, both variables get to be null, and so it prints two nulls. So I guess uh, strings aren't really arrays of characters in PHP. So then what does this code do? If I assign it to a variable first, well, I guess strings are arrays of characters here now. So yeah, uh, this is the sort of thing that PHP loves to do. I'm absolutely picking on specific corner cases in order to showcase some of the absurdities of the language. Most of the language isn't like this, but there are corner cases like this, like really bizarre behavior in, in a lot of places. Enough that individually, like this is not a big deal. Basically, just don't do this. But these corner cases come up enough and enough that in aggregate they start costing you time, both individually and as a developer or organization, as an engineering team. Things like this add up and add up and add up and cause bugs and then generally waste time. So that's some of the good parts and some of the ugly parts of PHP, which brings me to hack. So hack. Um, I've been complaining about PHP um, in, in talking about that in terms of hack. Um, what is hack? Hack is Facebook's dialect of PHP. It is PHP with some of the rough edges sanded off and Google's more features. In particular, it has a strong static type system that helps sand off some of those rough edges. It has first-class support for async functions, which help the programmer express ways to batch together I.O. And it also has a bunch of other goodies that I will be talking about later. So what does hack look like? Here on the left, we have a little bit of PHP. It opens with a typical opening tag, less than question mark PHP. I define a function increment, which takes a parameter x, returns x plus 1, and a function f, which calls increment with 42, echoes that back out. So if I were to call this function, it would print 43. Um, this is PHP. You're mostly probably familiar with PHP. If you're not, it's like most other scripting languages. On the right here is the equivalent hack code. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so the opening tag has changed from question mark PHP to question mark HH to indicate that this is hack instead of PHP. But other than that, this function doesn't really look that different. <coughs> no, excuse me. This function doesn't really look that different. It still takes a parameter x, returns x plus 1. Most of the syntax here is the same. The only other change is that I've added types in a few places here. That the, the input of this function increment is typed to take an int. And it returns an int, and the function f uh, doesn't return a value, it returns void. So as it turns out, the types that I've added here in this hack code on the right are just for illustration purposes. The language is gradually typed, meaning the typing is all optional. And so you could have left all of those types off, and it would still be valid hack. I just did this for illustration purposes, so that I didn't have code that was literally identical on the left and the right side. Hack is very much in the spirit of PHP. It's a dialect of PHP, and it looks an awful lot like PHP. Uh, which brings me to one of the guiding ideas of hack. Hack is all about developer efficiency. It's about making things better without switching to a totally new language or relearning everything. If you know PHP, you know Hack. It interoperates seamlessly with existing PHP code. You don't have to go write it all, rewrite it all. You can go convert some corner of the code base as it makes sense, use new features as they make sense, write some small project in it if that makes sense, interoperate with existing code. But it's more than that. It is also an evolution of PHP that provides new features such as asynchronous I.O., such as a, a real strong static type system to help prevent bugs, to move beyond some of the common pitfalls and some of the lots of the ways that people like to make fun of the PHP language and actually make something that works well, uh, that, that may, takes that base and makes it work even better and then add on top of that. So really quickly, what does the hack workflow look like? It's not all that different from the PHP workflow. You're going to write some code. You're going to save it in your editor. However, at this point, the hack type checker will get invoked, which will instantly provide you type errors in your editor um, within about 100 millisecond response time. We value the speed of the type checker to make sure that we keep that fast edit refresh cycle that I talked about with PHP. So now you have an even faster feedback loop. The second you save your code, instead of even having to tab to the browser and refresh and see that you've made some silly syntax error or some type error or some silly typo like that and get a blank page and have to go to the error logs and things like that, you can get basic set of errors directly in your editor with an instant response time, um, which can save you then the silly bugs so that you can go look at the more complicated things when you then tab to your browser 
and continue the normal fast iteration cycle of PHP. So at this point, most presentations will go and talk about the type system of hack. A lot of folks think of hack as PHP plus types. And so naturally, the next thing to talk about is the type system, how we use that to sand off some of the rough edges of PHP. But hack is much more than just PHP plus types. So I'm actually not going to talk about the static type system quite yet. I'm going to talk about what I think is one of the major killer features of hack, in particular for Wikimedia, which is async functions. Um, so async functions. Wikipedia is already running on HHVM. Whenever your code is actually running on the CPU, you're getting the speed benefits of HHVM in that respect. However, the latency of requests is not all about burning CPU. A lot of the actual wall time of requests is IO weight as well. And so async functions are designed to help deal with IO weight and make that faster in the spirit of hack without having to dramatically change the way you think about your code. Um, maybe a little bit of minor restructuring and refactoring, but it's not a massive change to the way you currently write, think about model code, and, and that sort of thing. This is really a killer feature for Facebook. When I recently heard a stat that when you go to the homepage of Facebook and load, load your news feed, you will execute about one million async functions over the course of doing that. Um, they're super heavily used at Facebook. It's how we make Facebook uh, as fast as it is and manage um, all of our complicated IO. So async functions. What do they look like in hack? Here's an example of a, a simple async function. This is going to call this curl exec function, which will load the graph endpoint for Mark Zuckerberg and get his data, JSON decode it, and return it. So when you first notice about this function, um, there are two new keywords here, async and await. The async keyword up here is a modifier to a function declaration. It says this is an async function. This function might be suspended if it ends up blocking on I.O., and the runtime might go off and run some other function if this one gets blocked, and the runtime is allowed to do that. Then there's this await keyword. Await keyword means take this other async function here that's going to go off and do something. Execute it until it blocks. And if it blocks, then go off and run some other async function that is waiting to run or may itself be blocked and data has come back and resume that. Um, the run, the, when you see this await statement, that's where the runtime is allowed to suspend execution of an, of an async function if it gets blocked on I.O. in the course of running this curl exec. Um, so just a single await like this, we basically got a wrapper around curl exec here, right? We have an async function awaiting on another async function that goes off and loads a graph endpoint. This isn't really doing a whole lot. You don't see all the benefits of batching and all of that with this simple function. So let's look at a more complicated example. Here's another function, um, which I began cleverly called get data. This function, though, is going to await on all of these three curl execs all at once. We're going to use this uh, helper function in the standard library called HHASIOV. Um, that stands for hack asynchronous IO vector. It takes a vector of objects. Um, vector is another feature of hack. It's a hack collection. I won't go into details about collections now. You can think of this as array if you want for now. Uh, it's going to call these three curl exec functions, get their results back into this $V variable, and then do something with them, in this case, implode. This code is going to run all three curl execs all in parallel. So if the first one takes time A, and the second one time B, and the third one time C, with synchronous code, this would take time A plus B plus C to execute. But written like just like this with asynchronous I.O., with the async features of hack, this will take a max of ABC to run, because as soon as we get blocked making the first curl request, we'll go fire off the second. When that one blocks, we'll go fire off the third. And then the runtime will deal with the coordination of resuming you when all three are done and signing it back into this vector $V for you. So you may be thinking, if you're really familiar with PHP, PHP has had a function, something like curl multi-exec or something like that, for quite a while. You can give it a list of URLs to do, and it'll basically do just this for you. So this isn't really showcasing the power of async functions and why it matters to have it as a first-class feature in the language. And here's an example that will showcase that. Uh, let me go to another uh, cleverly named get data function. 
Again, this get data function is going to await on a vector of things. But because the runtime is doing all the coordination for you, it can be a completely heterogeneous set of things. So the first thing I might do is, again, I want to fetch Mark Zuckerberg's graph, graph endpoint JSON data. But I also want to go to some DB, make some MySQL query, and fetch that data as well. And if that blocks, I, or when the curl request blocks, I want to go to the DB. And when all of that is blocked, I want to go off and I know Wikimedia, or Wiki, yeah, Wikimedia software uses a bunch of Lua extensions to compute things. Um, which, as far as the hack runtime is concerned, you can think of as sort of IO-ish. They can run in the background in a separate thread, and they don't interact with the rest of the runtime. So that's sort of like doing I.O. You can sort of, it's like RPC on the same machine, whatever. Um, but you can, you, you can absolutely model that as asynchronous I.O. It's not that complicated. And so while we're waiting on this data to come back from the database, we can go compute stuff out of this Lua extension, um, and we can execute all of these three things all at once, and let the runtime deal with the coordination of what finishes when, how exactly we thread things through, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can deal with a very heterogeneous set of I.O. here, because the runtime is coordinating it all for us. More interestingly, um, let's actually look at the definition of this fetch from DB function. This fetch from DB function is probably some other function that you wrote yourself. Um, it's going to be another async function where I await on a connection to localhost and then run a query, um, select star from whatever where we're Mark Zuckerberg or something like that. It doesn't really matter what the query is, but you can write async functions in terms of other async functions and build up these small reusable units and build up more complicated, more complicated queries and async queries on top of that. And because the runtime is coordinating all of it for you, it'll deal with suspending things when they're blocked, resuming them when they're not, and data is available. Um, resuming other things when other things are blocked, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, the runtime coordinates all of this for you. So I've been talking a lot about things running concurrently and running in the background. One of the major things that I said was nice about PHP is we have this linear request model. No global state shared between things, no locks, mutexes, anything like that. So how, how does async functions keep that nice thing about, about PHP? Uh, the answer that I've sort of alluded to as I've described this is that it is cooperative multitasking. Async functions in hack are cooperative multitasking. That means that your main body of hack code is still single threaded. So there's no mental model strip for anything like that. It's cooperative in that your code might uh, get suspended whenever you have an await statement, and some other asynchronous function might begin to execute there. But you know exactly when that's happening, whenever you wrote an await statement. So there's no preemption. You don't need any sort of locking or anything like that. No worry about critical sections. Of course, there is all sorts of threading and locking and nastiness like that happening behind the scenes in the runtime. But the programmer sitting on top, writing in hack, has to worry about none of that. The programmer thinks in terms of async functions, in terms of building up computations, in, uh, in, in linear data dependencies of async functions, awaiting on other async functions, awaiting on batches of async functions. No mutexes, no locking. All of that is deep in the bowels of the runtime. It has an implementation detail hidden away of the programmer. You don't have to think about anything like that. So the idea of asynchronous I.O. is not new to hack, of course. Um, as a matter of fact, the syntax and semantics in hack are very much inspired by C Sharp, which has an extremely similar mechanism. But there are other popular web programming languages which do asynchronous I.O. Node.js is a really good example of one of those. It was a popular language for web development, um, and it does asynchronous I.O. I think most things in Node.js are asynchronous, or it's easy to make them if they're not. But it doesn't model async I.O. quite the same way that Hack does. It models them with callbacks. You can do all sorts of sugar on top of it um, with uh, neat things like promises and, and things like that. But fundamentally, you're still writing code in terms of callbacks or in terms of do this thing, then call this anonymous function, resume execution here. Um, so here's a typical example of, of callback hell. I'm sure everyone has seen th this shape of code here. Even if you don't quite get your code into this you know, pyramid shape, like I said, you're still writing code in the callback style with do this thing that at some point later call this other function that is the rest of the computation. That's called continuation passing style. Um, do a computation, then call this continuation. And that's not how I think about writing code, basically ever. It's the sort of thing that in your programming 201 class, your professor might make you write code in CPS. It's the sort of thing that compilers do as a transform. Machines can do this for us. I don't ever like thinking about code in terms of CPS. 
And there's no reason that most programmers would have to write code in terms of CPS if they don't want to. The hack, the beauty of the async functions in hack is that you can keep thinking about code in terms of linear execution, even if it's not really linear execution, but the runtime manages all of that, building up continuations, suspending things, resuming the continuation later for you. You don't have to transform your code beyond saying, await this, await that. The runtime manages all of it for you. Um, it turns out that the ECMAScript committee actually thinks this is a good idea, too, and I believe the next version of ECMAScript is going to get async functions, and presumably Node will pick that up at some point. But you can get that in hack right now with no new versions of ECMAScript, no transpilers or anything like that. We have it as a first-class facility right now to continue writing code the way you're thinking about it, the way you're used to thinking about it, while still getting the benefits of data fetching and asynchronous on it. Um, so as a last example, uh, I want to go walk through something a little bit more complicated. Let's suppose that we are building a simple social network. And like any good social network, we're going to have pieces of content, we're going to have users, and those pieces of content are going to have privacy associated with them. And so let's look at what a simple privacy checking function might look like. We're going to build up this async function that's going to do some data fetching. It's going to be called can see. It's going to take a user and a piece of content and determine if the user can see that piece of content. On our social network, let's just suppose that we have a very simple model of privacy. There are two privacy settings that the piece of content could have. It could be visible to friends of the author or friends of friends of the author. And so let's look at how we might write that. So the way I think about it, everything that I just described is in terms of friends and friends of friends of people and who's friends and who can see things. So the first thing I'm probably going to want to do is take the content, get its author, and get the friends of that author. Now, if I have this piece of content, I could probably get the author for free. Uh, presumably, I have that in memory right now. But getting the friends of that author is probably going to require some sort of database query, um, like select UID where friend people. I don't know quite what it looks like. But this is going to require some sort of data fetching. And so we're going to wait on it. Um, and so we're going to do data fetching for the friends, we'll wait on it, and assign it into this $f variable. Now, what we need to do now depends on um, what the privacy of the content is. So if this, we're going to switch on the privacy. If it is friend privacy, then we're basically done. Um, we're going to take this friend set, see if it contains the user ID. Um, if so, then this user is a friend of the author of the piece of content, and we return it true or false there. And we're done with the data fetching. However, let's suppose that it is friend of friend privacy. We're going to need to do a little bit more data fetching here. And so that's just exactly what we write. We already have the friends of the author, so let's get the friends of the user. Um, and think about this for a little bit. Um, you can determine if you're friend to friend by just intersecting the friends of the author and the friends of the user. And so that's exactly what we do. Um, we just fetch the friends of the user, intersect them, take account of that, see if it's greater than zero. Um, and if it is, then you can see it. Otherwise, you don't have any friends in common. And friends, and friends in common, and you fail the friend to friend test. So again, this is basically code for something fairly complicated, data fetching wise. That, is just, that just reads like I would think about writing it in terms of synchronous code. Fetch the friends, look at the privacy, see what I need to do, and, and then do that, fetching more data if I need it. There's no uh, dealing with callbacks here, no anonymous functions, nothing like that, just straight linear code. But it still has the benefits of being able to be run in parallel with something else that is fetching data. Um, you're writing asynchronous code, asynchronous I.O., in the way that you are used to thinking about that code. OK, so I'll talk about one of the major features of Hack, asynchronous I.O. Um, and now I'm talking about coming back to static types, uh, the feature that everybody loves to think about for Hack, because it's certainly very important. So I said earlier that Hack has a real strong static type system. What does that mean? First of all, it's a static type system. You can get type errors before you run your code, directly in your editor, immediately. You can catch bugs while the information about the code that you just wrote is still paged into your head. It's also a real type system. Uh, in hack strict mode, if all of your code is in hack strict mode, then you can't, if the type checker accepts it, then you can't get any type errors at runtime. Uh, so it is a real, strong, static type system. So let's go through some of the features of the type system and, and see what it, what it looks like. 
So first, um, I'm going to write a function in hack called even age. I'm going to take a user and return true or false. Is the age of this user even? Kind of a silly function, but it serves the example. So the first thing we're going to see here is this even age function is going to take a user dollar u, but I have this question mark out in front of the user type. PHP has object types like user, and object types in PHP are not nullable. However, um, they're not nullable unless you say that it has a default value of null. In hat, we've separated out default values from nullability, and this question mark is how we indicate nullability. So this is a potentially null user here because of the question mark. Then this even age has a return type. PHP 5 doesn't have return types, but the RFC to add them was accepted for PHP 7. Um, so this, is, this works exactly the same in hack as it will in PHP 7. And this function is going to return a Boolean. Hack has scalar types such as bool, int, string, float, that sort of thing. They are strictly enforced. PHP, even PHP 7, does not have scalar types. Um, they are currently debating whether to add them. For anybody who's been following the discussion on the mailing list, there's uh, quite a vigorous debate about how this should work. But Hack has them, Hack has them right now, and they are, they are strict, as you would expect. OK, so we are taking this function. It's going to take a potentially null user, and it's going to return a Boolean whether the age is even. Now, what I'd really like to do is get the age of this user, take it mod 2, that will determine if, if the age is even. But this user is potentially null. So what do I do? Um, so I can't just call the get age function on the user. I'd be calling a function on a potentially null object. The type checker wouldn't like that. You can only call methods on non-null objects. So how do I make this potentially null user into a non-null user? Well, in idiomatic PHP, you just say, you know, if not user, return false, or some default value doesn't really matter what it returns here. And you can do the same in hack. The type checker is flow sensitive, so it understands idioms like if not user, return. And so it knows after this if statement that the user can't be null anymore. And so we'll allow you to call the get age function on it and then return age mod 2, and if that's equal to 0, then the user has an even age. Um, and, and so this is type correct hack code. The type checker can actually type check all the way through this and verify that you're doing the right thing. Importantly, you might want to notice what's missing from here, um, which is an annotation on the age local variable. The type checker can infer that that's going to be an int, presumably because user get age is, in, uh, is annotated to return int. You only have to annotate in hack at function boundaries, function parameters, and function return types. All locals are inferred, which saves you an awful lot of typing and retyping of, of types in some other languages uh, like Java or even C. We can infer all the locals like this. So that's some of the simple examples of the type system. Let's look at a more complicated example. Let's look at the typical box class. Um, it's going to be a generic class that takes some object in its constructor and then can return it. There's a simple holder. So box, this is going to be box of t. This is a generic. Um, hack generics look the same as they do in a lot of other languages. We're going to be parameterized over any arbitrary type t. We're going to have a function, a uh, constructor, excuse me, which looks like a PHP constructor, except for this little bit of syntax here, private t dollar x. This is a neat little feature of hack, a small little thing called constructor argument promotion. What this does is simultaneously defines a parameter to the constructor of type t called $x, and it also defines a private variable, or excuse me, a private member variable on the, on the class box of type t called x, and then assigns the parameter x into the uh, member variable x in the constructor. It's a really common pattern, it's just a shorthand for that. Um, and as a matter of fact, it's a really nice shorthand because it allows this example to fit on my slide. So we have this uh, private t member variable, and then I can get return t, return this arrow x, and so this is the box that would operate as you'd expect. So hack has generics, they look like this. How do you use it though? Let's use a function f that's going to use this box, and f is going to return a string. So to use it, I just say you know, dollar $box equals new box, pass the, uh, the dollar $x here, the parameter $x into the constructor, it's going to be the int 42, and then I'm going to return box arrow get. If you notice, again, the local here dollar box was inferred. Even though it's a generic, I don't have to write that this is a box of ints anywhere. The type checker can infer that for me. And as a matter of fact, it can see that the code I've written here on the slide is a type error. 
even though I haven't written whether this is a box of int or a box of string, the type checker can, can see the error here. And let's actually look at what the error looks like. So the type checker is going to say, OK, you have an invalid return type. This doesn't work. This is bad. And it's going to point to the line and column numbers, as you'd expect. But the type checker is going to do more than that. Just saying that there is an error here is, well, it's useful, but we can be a lot more useful than that. We can point to how we inferred what things were what and what the incompatibility was. So more than just this line is bad, we can say, well, you wrote a string here, and it's incompatible with the int that you put here. We keep witnesses for all of our types whenever we're doing inference on locals, even through generics. So we can point to things like this and say, you wrote string, and I think this is a box of int, and so the return is bad, and here is where the int was that I said this was a box of int for. We can give really good error messages that, that explain the incompatibility, um, unlike many languages uh, that I've worked with, to help the programmer figure that sort of thing out. So why static types? Why, why is this a good thing for PHP? PHP is a very dynamic language and actually derives a lot of power from that. So how does adding a static type system on top of that, which is of necessity going to restrict the dynamic nature of PHP a little bit? Why is that a good thing? So the obvious answer is this here. Um, here's my example from like, the very beginning, this you know, list syntax on strings. What does it do? Well, the fact that this is inconsistent here is uh, irrelevant in hack. These are both type errors. You just can't do this. We use the hack type system to sand off tons and tons and tons and tons of edge case um, absurdities like this in PHP. We just entirely rule them out with the type system. And so you'll get that type error immediately and not have to worry that th this is bizarrely inconsistent. However, this is absolutely an edge case. And so the type system is good for much more than just sanding off all these edge cases. Um, let's take a look at a, a somewhat more realistic example. Let's go back to our social network from earlier that we're building up. Uh, another common feature of social networks is some sort of news feed. So here's a function we might think of that, that renders a news feed. We're going to get some sort of you know, raw, raw stories from our back end, maybe ranked, maybe something like that. Uh, it doesn't really matter how, how this works. Then we're going to take all of those raw stories and do some data fetching get all of the you know, rich story data, the photos, the you know, sound, and other stuff, whatever it is we want to display in our news feed. Then for each of those stories, we're going to render it and echo it out to the page. So can anybody look at this code and see what the bug is here? What's wrong with this code? Think about it for a second. So what's wrong with this? It, it, it depends. It's a little bit of a trick question. The crux of what I'm getting at is how do we deal with error handling here? In particular, what happens if this second line, get story data raw stories, fails? Maybe one of these raw stories, there's a database down and we can't fetch the photo for it. How do we deal with failure? We probably don't want to throw an exception in the get story data function. Because then that exception would propagate, or at least it would kill all the data fetching for the raw stories, probably propagate out of the render feed function. And we don't want to completely blank someone's news feed and fail to render it. If just one story is failed, we'd like to null out that story and continue on. And so get story data is probably going to return an array with nulls in it or something like that. But, but, but is that what it's going to return? Who is responsible for the error handling here? Who deals with the relevant nulls that are inevitably going to come up here? Does get story data return an array of things that's potentially null? And is render story OK with that? Or is get story data expected to filter down the stories to the ones that it could successfully fetch data for and eliminate the rest, such that render story never has to worry about that? This is one of the ways, a more realistic example, of where a type checker can really come in handy. It can mechanically verify that either get story data or render story has dealt with your failures, has dealt with your nulls, and that one of them isn't going to randomly explode whenever your database falls down you know, three weeks after you write this code and didn't think about it, and suddenly everything explodes in production. We can mechanically verify that what you've written makes sense right now. Um, I want to be clear, because sometimes people mishear me when I'm talking about examples like this. Type systems are not a replacement for testing in any way, shape, or form. They're a good way to help find bugs like this. They're a really good supplement to testing. 
and a way to mechanically sort of automatically get a bunch of tests, which are the consistency of your type system. But they are not a replacement for testing. Please don't hear me say that. OK, so I'm going back to my question from a moment ago. Why static types? In a sentence, types help you manage technical debt. Here's some examples of, of what, how that can help. Types can help you find subtle bugs. Back to my newsfeed example a moment ago, they can help you find maybe a latent crash in there when a database goes down by telling you there's a type error immediately. They can help you, prevent you from writing corrupt data into a database that will then be there for all time forward unless you go like write some script to go fix it. Really, really painful things. Uh, my favorite example of this is, at least in PHP, uh, silently converting nulls to the integer 0 in some cases and running those into a database when you really want a null or maybe your code should be doing something else. Um, that's a good way to get data corruption. There's a bunch of others, and types can help prevent a lot of common causes of that. Types can also help you flesh out APIs and make sure they make sense. Again, in my previous example on about newsfeed, it makes it clear in that API who is responsible for dealing with failures and for checking for nulls. Types make it clear who's, who's supposed to be doing that. Again, not a panacea, but it helps make APIs well uh, clear and well defined and, and machine check that. And finally, whenever you inevitably get it wrong, everyone refactors things and changes things, types help you refactor that code. If you're going to change who handles the null in my newsfeed example, you move the null annotation from one place to another, and the type checker immediately points out all of the places that you now need null checks. And you can go, um, again, mechanically verify that what you've done makes sense. If you want to rename a method, a type checker can help you make sure that you've found all of the call sites whenever you're renaming it, and so on and so forth. So type check types help you avoid technical debt and fix it whenever you inevitably have it. Again, not a panacea, but it helps an awful lot it's been invaluable for Facebook, and I think it's invaluable in general. So some other features of Hack. First is backwards compatibility. I touched on this a little bit before. Hack and PHP have the same runtime representation inside HHVM. Calls back and forth between the two languages are 100% completely free. This means that you can convert code gradually as it makes sense. Maybe some core part of your code would really benefit from async functions. And you can go take that core, write it with async functions, but keep, keep the rest in PHP. You don't want to convert it now. Not a big deal. The calls in and out is, are completely free. You can maybe write some new feature, some new tool, some new something in half. Um, again, completely free interoperability with all of your existing code. Wikimedia is already on HHVM, meaning you can experiment with this right now um, against your existing code base since you're already set up um, with, with, uh, with HHVM. But backwards compatibility doesn't all mean just with your existing code. Again, since HAP runs on HHVM, it is backwards compatible with your existing deployment strategies, with your existing monitoring strategies that are already working on the large body of PHP code that you have deployed in production today. But better than backwards compatibility is forward compatibility. We recently released the hack transpiler, which converts hack code to PHP. This means that, in particular, the uh, MediaWiki project, which I understand you want to keep releases available for folks who haven't switched to HHVM yet and are still running on PHP 5 or Bitcoin PHP 7, you can write your code in hack and then use the hack transpiler to generate a release that is compatible with folks who aren't running HHVM. It also means that if you really have to, if you decide this hack thing was all a bad idea, you can run the hack transpiler across all of your code all at once, convert it back into PHP, and be done with it. Um, of course, I hope you don't do that, but it, it, is, it is an option and something that you could, in principle, do. In, in the interest of full disclosure and honesty here, uh, the hack transpiler is still a little bit experimental and doesn't support all the features that I've talk, talked about and will be talking about for Hack. Um, I won't bother with the laundry list right now. But more important than that, if the Hack transpiler, and it's working on some feature or some something like that, is a blocker for anyone wanting to use Hack, um, particularly, at, no, particularly here, I am more than happy to work with you and to make sure that the Hack transpiler fits your needs, if that is blocking you. So please um, let me know. I'm happy to work with you on 
making sure this tool gets to where you need it to be if it is not currently there today. Another feature of Hack is XHP. XHP is sort of like templating, but it's much more powerful than that. This is how Facebook renders all of its UI. So XHP is a way of embedding XML-ish elements directly into your hack code, manipulating them as objects, defining new classes as actual classes in your code, and then so on and so forth. It has a lot of the same benefits as existing templating engines, which is helping separate out your markup from most of your controller logic, doing things like making sure that your escaping runs on all unsafe strings, et cetera, et cetera. But it has a lot of other benefits that I've not seen in any other templating engines, such as Twig or Smarty um, or anything else like that out in the PHP world. So let's look at some examples and, and look at what I think is the power of XHP. So we're going to have this, so here's a simple example. Here's a function f, which is going to return some arbitrary XHP element. In particular, it's going to return a UL. And if you notice this syntax here in the return, this looks an awful lot like just embedding HTML or XML straight into your uh, hack code. We're going to say, OK, I'm going to open a UL. This UL has a class attribute. We're going to call this my fun list. It has two items, item one. And then item two is going to be this dollar text high test. And that's going to be properly escaped, as you'd expect. However, this UL is an actual object, an actual class and an actual object inside your hack code here, meaning that I can manipulate it as an object and I can define my own new classes and use them just like I'm using this UL here. So let's look at an example of how we might define a new XHP class. I'm going to find an, a Facebook feed story, and it's going to extend to the, the uh, XHP element base. Um, I'm glossing over a lot of details about how exactly you extend things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, I can go into that later if anyone's interested, but this is the definition of a new feed story. It's going to have an attribute, just like you might have class or style. This is going to have an attribute called story that's required, and it's going to take a feed story object instead of like a class name or, or a style, CSS style, or anything like that. Then, in order to render a feed story, I just write some hack code in this render function. I'm going to grab the story attribute out, um, build up this div, and the div is going to have a class story. I'm going to take the story's title and put it in this fb title element. So if you notice, I've defined a new element here, fb feed story, and I'll show you an example of how you use this in a moment. But importantly, I've defined it in terms of another custom element that I presumably defined elsewhere called fb title. You can build up these small units of functionality and then compose bigger and bigger elements in terms of the smaller things, the smaller reusable components that you have defined. And that's something that I've not seen any other templating engine let you do. Now here's how you actually use the FB feed story I just defined. We're going to have this render function, which is we're going to render a feed. It's going to take an array of feed stories. It's going to start with an empty feed, just dollar feed equals FB feed slash this is just an empty feed. But this dollar feed is an actual object. I can iterate over my stories and add a new child into it. And the new child is going to be this FB feed story I find on the last slide. I'm going to give it this story attribute and stick it in. A lot of templating engines will let you do things like this via a for each loop inside the definition of this FB feed in some sort of domain specific language. We let you use the code that you are used to using, the hack language, the PHP language and just manipulate this thing as an object, and then return it back out to either continue to be manipulated or be stuck into some larger component. Again, the way you're sort of used to thinking about writing code, but doing it to manipulate UI elements. The power of this, um, and how useful, making small reusable components, defining larger components as compositions of those, manipulating things in code, like on this example, the power of that is invaluable to Facebook once you've started using it over, over other templating engines. Um, and I think, at least the complicated UIs, could be invaluable for all of you as well. So another feature, feature that I alluded to earlier are hack collections. Hack collections are replacement for PHP's arrays. For folks that are really familiar with PHP, it basically has one data structure, the array. The array data structure in PHP is the kitchen sink. It is sometimes a vector, sometimes a map, sometimes a set. Who knows which one it is? You sort of have to like have that knowledge in your head um, because they all operate the same. This also means the standard library functions, 
either have to be told or have to guess, usually whether you meant a map-like array or a vector-like array. Again, folks who are familiar with PHP might know the difference between plus and array merge, and when you might want to use one, and when you might want to use other. Um, array merge actually tries to guess whether the array that you sent it is a vector-like array or a map-like array, and I really hope that the map that you sent in didn't have integer keys and that they weren't like something important like user IDs, otherwise you're going to be in for a really nasty surprise. So hack collections separate out the concerns of all of those while defining new objects. Hack collections are actually objects, um, which also lets some other nice things happen. So let's look at an example of a piece of code written um, with the functional style of arrays in PHP, and then the equivalent code using hack collections. So we're going to write this somewhat weird function called get post friends. It's going to take the first parameter posts, get the authors of all of those posts, and return the subset of those authors, which are friends, with the given user, the second parameter here. Kind of a strange function, but it is just to illustrate how, how these collections work. So we'd like lots of maps and filters here to work on these collections. So when I think about this, and the way I just described it, what I'm probably going to want to do is take these posts, map them down to the authors of the posts, and then filter down those authors to the ones that are friends with the user. So in functional style, you've got to write it the other way around. Filter, then map, because you've got to write it inside out, basically. So OK, let's look at the map. This map is first going to take an actual mapping function. Um, here's the PHP syntax for that. Function takes in a post, return post to get author. And that's going to map over all the posts. Um, this is a fairly verbose anonymous function here, um, but the next one's even more verbose. In order to filter these down, um, this, another anonymous function is going to take an author, but it also needs to close over this dollar user. It needs to refer to the dollar user as this parameter defined in the outer scope. And this can return author is friends with. Um, and we're going to filter this down. So we've sort of written this inside out. This is kind of ugly. The anonymous functions are really verbose. But there's some more subtle issues going on here. First of all is that array filter and array map take their arguments in the reverse order. Array map takes the anonymous function first. Array filter takes the array first. Um, and so that's, that's fairly awkward, particularly when you're looking at code like this, um, that the functions come backwards. But even more subtle than that, because PHP arrays, this dollar posts array, are both maps and sets and vectors, depending on how you want to use them, does anybody actually know, looking at this code, if dollar posts is intended to be a vector or a map, does this code preserve keys or not? I had to go look at the definition of PHP Standard Library. I, I don't ever remember this. Um, it turns out that array filter and array map do preserve keys. So this would operate fine on a map-like posts. It would probably operate fine on a vector-like posts too, except with this filter you're going to get uh, non-contiguous elements, which may or may not matter. Um, and it's just kind of messy. Uh, it's something you have to think about a lot, and it's not really clear what's going on. So let's look at the same example uh, with hack collections, where we've separated out uh, the different collections and it's made a lot of things very nice. So here's the function prototype. Uh, again, hack code, uh, get post friends. We are explicitly saying we are taking a vector of posts. This isn't a map. It isn't a set. It is a vector. We're not preserving keys. We're keeping everything contiguous. It says so right here in the signature. And um, the, the collections and the type checker APIs will make sure that you do the right thing. And then we've got the user here. So again, I think about this in terms of map and filter. And that's exactly what we're going to write. Since posts is an object, it can have a map function on it, posts arrow map. Um, and then we take a post and return post get author. This is using another little feature of hack called short lambda syntax. This is semantically equivalent to the anonymous function I wrote on the last slide. It's just a lot shorter. Function takes a post, returns post get author. Then, well, you can take an arrow map, an arrow filter. Author, arrow author is friends with user. Uh, with the short lambda syntax, we don't need to explicitly capture this dollar user from the outer scope. So this is a lot cleaner because collections are objects. We have short lambda syntax, and because we've made it clear the separation of concerns between whether it's a vector, whether it's a map, separated all of that back out. 
Um, so that's all I have to talk about hack today. Uh, hopefully I convinced you that hack is a really useful, um, both evolution of PHP and also a really great language in and of itself. You can check out uh, hacklang.org for more details on the language, download, uh, download the runtime and the type checker, try it out. All this is open source. There's a link to GitHub on hacklang.org um, so you can check it out, check out the source yourself as well. And at this point, I'm happy to take questions. So what percentage of Facebook code base has already been converted into it? Depends on how you want to count. If you count files that have just HH at the top, like 98 or 99 percent. If you want to count files that use hack language features, I would guess probably most of them due to the prevalence of async functions. If you want to look at things that use just the hack type system, which is something that we track fairly closely, um, something like Again, depending on what metric you looked at, something like 60 to 70 percent of our front end code is type checked. So, an awful, 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 awful lot of it. So, you mentioned how you can uh, generate PHP from Hack. Yes. Uh, so, would it be feasible to develop in Hack so you get all of the stack typing mm -hmm. benefits, but then basically distribute your code as PHP sort of like? the way TypeScript works. Uh, yes, that is the actually intended use case for the hack transpiler. Um, okay. It's intended for your canonical source on GitHub or whatever to be in hack. And so people that are contributing would probably have to write in hack to make sure that you keep your thing tech front, et cetera, et cetera. But when you make like a tarball to distribute as a release, or even if you're not running HHVM on your production servers to do a push, that you would then run the transpiler, generate your PHP, either send your tarball upstream for users that you have that are HHVM or to your servers or whatever. Um, that's, out, that's exactly the intended use case. Cool. We have five more minutes for questions. Um, S on um, IRC wants to know if anyone's using the transpiler. Um, not for anything of the scale of what Wikimedia is. So I, I don't want to be dishonest. It's still a little bit experimental. There are missing features. Um, but anything, if, any, if there are any problems that you run into or any missing features, I want to make it work for you. Um, Wikimedia was actually one of the people that I had in mind as probably a customer for this eventually, or at least hoped. So um, I'm happy to get whatever resources uh, that you need from Facebook site working on it to make sure that it works for you. How many people at uh, Facebook are working on Hack specifically as a, a, like the, the, the language features? Depends on how you want to count. Um, so there are two and a half, three people working on the type system, the type checker, um, which I guess I'm counting myself in that. What was that? Six by my count. Six by your, oh right, we got two more. Yeah. yeah, plus another, maybe six, depending on how you want to count that, plus another, how big is the open source team? Another six people working on HHVM open source, a lot of which ends up being hack language features, but also compatibility HHVM with PHP. Um, and then there's like the performance team, which you probably don't want to count. So anywhere between 6 to 10 or 12, depending on how you count it. More questions from Marcy? Uh, can, can I have a question? Sure. So uh, uh, you told that when you talked about static type system that if static checker uh, passes the code, then it cannot produce an error on, in runtime. So how that uh, works with uh, dynamic uh, features of PHP, like dynamic function call, call the user function, and so yeah. on? Um, it doesn't. So some of those, so one of the things I glossed over in the talk is that Hack actually has three modes for its typing. Um, the two that are important for this discussion are called partial and strict. All of the code that I showed in my slides was actually partial mode. Um, since, uh, are, are my slides still visible to, oops, I turned that off. Uh, we, so here, um, this has the HH header at the top. So this is partial mode by default. Partial mode rules out some of the really egregious dynamic features of PHP. Uh, but it allows things like missing type annotations and interoperability with PHP code that isn't typed at all. And so you don't have the sound of guarantees that I was describing in partial mode. You have the guarantees that what we have annotated, we will check, but things can be missing, things can be incomplete, things can be dynamic, and we are able to check that. And so you absolutely can get runtime type errors in partial mode. There's so by so by the, the, features, you, you mean dynamic functions and uh, such? Sorry, can you say that again? 
Uh, by egregious features, you mean like dynamic functions and such? We don't allow dynamic function definitions. I think we still allow things like call user funk array in partial mode. And we just won't be able to type check that function call. Um, in general, when hack can't type check something, we just assume the programmer knows what they're doing. So, so call, a, call user function just doesn't type check? You mean you can actually pass uh, object of wrong type and it would be actually passed on runtime? Correct. Because you're using partial mode, correct. So However, what, can... what would happen on the receiving side if you get the object of wrong type? Um, then you might get a runtime type error if there's an annotation on the function that you're calling that says that it expects an object of different type, just like you uh -huh. would in PHP if you pass something of the wrong type. Mm -hmm. We do disallow these dynamic features in strict mode, which you can turn on by putting slash slash strict after your HH opening tag. And then the type checker goes into the, this strict mode um, where it doesn't allow dynamic function calls. It doesn't allow a bunch of things. Everything has to be annotated. Um, and if all of your code is in strict mode, then you shouldn't be able to get a runtime type error, barring any bugs in the type checker itself. And, and they are considered yeah. bugs. Uh, last question. Uh, would there be a way to do uh, call the friends method on you speculatively before you know if it's needed, uh, then only use it sometime? That's not usually how we think about structuring code. Um, because it's not callback based, you shouldn't need any of that speculative stuff. It's just when I need it, I await on it. You want to have these strict data dependencies so that you aren't overfetching data and overweighting on your data. Um, it, yeah. Um, be, be, yeah, because it's so easy to write that code. You just fetch data as you need it, and we deal with the parallelism. Um, you do want to structure it in terms of data dependencies, though, so things that aren't dependent, you don't end up blocking them and doing extra rounds of fetching. OK, uh, we're out of time. Thank you so much. I'll find a way for Josh to be able to answer, qu answer questions by email uh, for everybody yeah, who happy has to. more questions. Um, so thank you so much for coming. All on IRC. Thank you.